appreciate it. Thank you all very much. That's very nice. Frankly, much more than I deserve. Uh, and not a bad round of applause for someone you've never heard of and you have no idea who I am or why I'm here. Um, first of all, I want to thank, this is a great event. I'm really thrilled to be here. I want to thank Kalea, uh, Emily, Steve. You have a, such a great team running uh, your board and your organization. They really represent you well. I've seen them uh, at industry events like Inman and things like that. And they always, uh, I think, represent Austin well. So you should be very proud of them. And they put on this great event. They invited me to come here because I wrote a book. And I wrote a book about disruption in the real estate space, about the, the people that are trying to come and evict us from the real estate transaction or change the business model or do things that really would uh, uh, disrupt the way we live, our, the way we run our businesses. Um, so I wrote the book. And the basic theory of it is that we need to make changes in our industry if we're going to fight off disruption. And I had someone come up to me recently who read it and said, you know, I've been hearing this for 20 years. He says, you know, everybody runs around like a chicken with their head cut off. Everybody's worried about someone's going to come in and change the industry. And I've been hearing about that since I got into the business in the 90s. You know, but he, and he said he made a really good point. He said, you know, as much as the Internet has changed so much, the real estate transaction is pretty much the same. I mean, think about it. We're 20 years into the internet era, and like, yes, we have a lot more digital marketing than analog marketing. There's e-signatures now, and we don't fax anymore. Most of us don't fax anymore, hopefully. Um, but like, it's still seller lists with a listing broker. It gets put into MLS. It offers a compensation to buyer agents. Buyer agents represent the buyer. They can show the buyer any property in the MLS. Uh, then the buyer makes an offer, offer accepted. You have to go through inspection. You have to go through escrow and closing and title. Um, uh, you got to go through the contracts and everything like that. And he says it's pretty much the same process that it was 20 years ago. Everyone says it's going to change and hasn't changed. And I said, that's the problem. We're 20 years into one of the greatest technological revolutions in world history, and we're still, real estate transactions are still pretty much the way they were 20 years ago. We haven't done anything to really improve them or change the consumer experience. And the reason is that as an industry, not any individual of us, but just collectively as an industry, we've not been focused enough on what our clients need. We haven't been thinking about them, we've been thinking too much about ourselves. And just to give you an example about this, so we're, we're facing all these challenges now. We've got companies coming in that are gonna discount, we have companies coming in that are trying to change the business model, we have companies coming in that are just trying to get between us and our consumers. Why are we such targets? I summarize it this way, the free CMA. What is the free CMA? Everybody, uh, real estate industry for years, we put it on our business cards, call me for a free CMA, call me for a complimentary CMA. Why did we do that? We did that because we recognized that consumers had a need. They wanted to know what their home was worth. They, they just kind of, it was something they were curious about. So what we did was we said, well, if they need that, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to turn that need into a sales opportunity. Like we offered a free CMA, but it wasn't a free CMA. If they called us and said, can I have a free CMA, we wouldn't say, oh, your house is worth about 350 Thanks, goodbye, and hang up. No. We go in, we do the full listing presentation. Here's my 29-point marketing plan. Here's a picture of me with, you know, getting an award. Here are some of my reviews. Here are some of my testimonials. The free CMA was basically a come on to do a listing presentation. That we took this need that consumers had and we flipped it into an opportunity for ourselves to try to make a sale. And then, yes, at the end of the presentation, we might give them the CMA, but like they had to sit through the presentation first. They didn't want a listing presentation. They just wanted to know what the home was worth. And so they didn't call us, right? We don't, you don't get a lot of calls on the free CMA because people know it's like when you go on vacation and they're like, oh, you know, you can get a free dinner if you just go through the timeshare presentation. Like, oh, God, I don't want to sit through a three-hour timeshare presentation just for a free dinner. So it didn't work. People saw through it. It was just this very cynical ploy that we had because we took what people needed and we tried to turn it into a sales opportunity. And so what happened? What happened to this need? Zillow happened. A company came along and said, we're gonna service the need. People wanna know what their home is worth? Okay, cool. Press this button, we'll tell you what your home is worth. Now, it wasn't really good. The Zestimate didn't really, wasn't accurate or anything like that, but at least it was, they were trying to answer the question. And they didn't make people sit through a three hour presentation to get it. And they built a $10 billion business based on nothing other than servicing a need that we were not attentive to, that we weren't paying attention to, that we were trying to turn into a sales opportunity. 
So what does that tell us? It tells us how many other opportunities are there like that? Think about this way. We used to be the people that everyone went to when they needed a landscaper. They needed an alarm installer. You call your realtor. That's the way we position ourselves. We're like the custodians of your home. We're the ones who advise you what you need to do with your home. We have a list. How many of you right now have a list? Like someone calls you, they need an alarm installer. You got somebody, right? They need a landscaper. You got somebody. We still do it, and I think every one of you, if you got a call from a former client that asked you a question, hey, can you recommend me something, you'd be thrilled to do it. But yet we never really systematized that process and let people know because we were so focused on getting sales and like answering someone's question about what landscaper they want isn't going to sell a house. So we left the door open. Now Angie's List, more billion-dollar companies built on servicing needs that we could have serviced that we neglected. Why? Well, it's because our whole industry is so focused entirely on sales. It's focused on this conception of the real estate agent as a salesperson. Now, here's the thing. Real estate agents are not just salespeople. Yes, sales is an element of your job. But when we call somebody a salesperson, we're referring to somebody who, like, they make the connection, they make the sale, and then they hand off the deal to somebody else. Like, if you're a pure salesperson, you don't actually have to service that account. Like, think about, like, what mortgage professionals do, like loan officers. The loan officer's job is to cultivate relationships with realtors and consumers to market themselves and then to sit down with the consumer and get them to fill out an application. And what happens then? They get to hand it off. Do you get to do that? When you take a listing, do you like, you go back to the office, hey, I got a listing. Let me go hand it off to the person that's going to go take care of it for the next six months. I'm off to get another one. No, you got to service it. But yet as an industry, all our attention has gone to developing your sales skills, not developing your client service skills. So like you go to a conference and like every event will be about how do you generate leads? Generate leads from your sphere, generate leads from farming, generate leads from the internet, generate leads from social media. Not like what do you do when you actually catch them? You know, we, we spend all this time, it's like dogs chasing a car, the car stops, the dog's like, I don't know, why was I chasing this car? What, what, what am I gonna do now? We don't teach people what to do when the car stops. And, but it's not just agents, it's not just education. Think about like the way our, we've innovated for the last 20 years. Think about our websites, every website, including mine, including mine. I'm in the same boat as everybody else. Every real estate website that's ever been built has been built to do what? One thing. What's the one thing they've been designed to do? To get people to fill out that form. Get people, get shoppers, to get eyeballs, to look at real estate, to say, hey, I want to find out more. Click here and become a lead. That's why we build our websites. That they're built for shoppers. We don't build them to service our clients. We build them to generate leads for ourselves. And the way I know that is, I'll say this, half our clients are sellers. You meet with a seller. You sign them to a contract. Wouldn't it make sense that that seller, the next thing you would do would say, oh, here's your login to, to log into our website to get stuff, but there's nothing there for them. There's no reason for a seller to even look at your website except to make sure that the listing's there and the pictures are right, and God forbid they're not right because you're going to have a lot of trouble, but that's all they ever do is they look at their own listing on the website. We don't build services on our websites for our sellers. We don't build services even for our buyers because once someone is ready to buy a home, they pretty much, they're not doing the, the shopping on the website anymore. They're shopping with you. You're sending them listings in all sorts of different ways, usually from MLS or from somewhere else. So even like the shop, and once they get into a contract, there's nothing on our websites that helps them through the difficult transactional process because all of our innovative energies for 20 years have been built to generate leads, not to actually service the clients that we're working with. And that's our blind spot. That's why... <coughs> We're open for disruption, and it leads to all sorts of problems. So, for example, why well, I went to, it leads to problems. Like, check out a survey here from Gallup, opinion of honesty and ethics of real estate agents. The orange is average, and that's okay. Average among other professionals. High and very high is the blue, low and very low is the green. Well, we're really right there in that middle part, right? Well, most say average, some say high, some say low, but it's not particularly impressive. But then you put it in context. Here's the context. Now, some of you can't read some of these other professions, but when you compare us to other professions, the blue line at the far left, accountants. They have a much higher 
Honesty and integrity. All right, accountants are pretty important. Then the next thing is journalists. Everyone hates journalists, but they're still number two on this list. The next are building contractors. And I love building contractors. I have a lot of respect for them. But, like, there's a stereotype about building contractors that everything comes in late and more expensive than they told you it was going to come in. And yet, they're still to the left of, we haven't gotten to us yet. Then there's bankers. Bankers almost destroyed the world ten years ago. And they're ahead of us. Lawyers. Now it's getting embarrassing. Then we get to real estate agents. And we did beat out insurance salespeople, stockbrokers, advertising salespeople. And at the bottom there, the last one, is members of Congress. Now that's sad for a bunch of other reasons, but it's certainly not great how we are perceived by the public, how we're perceived in, in public media. You know, the, the Alec Baldwin speech, Cookie Kwan, number one on the west side on The Simpsons. You know, the one positive realtor stereotype we have in pop culture is Phil Dunphy, who at least is an honest guy, even though it's a show about really smart people and he's the only dumb one. He's the goofball. He's the realtor. So it leads us to this. We've got an industry that's focused on training people on sales, investing in uh, innovation in sales, developing a public image that is based on us as salespeople, not developing service skills. So what happens to the competency of the industry? Let me ask you this question. And I'm gonna ask for a show of hands, so I'm gonna need you to raise your hand if you have a positive answer to this. How many of you, if you were knowing everything you know now, but you were no longer in the industry, and you had to list your home with someone in the industry, how many of you would be willing to list your home with more than 50% of the agents in your market? Hello? Anybody? Is this working? Is this on? I got, I got one guy. I got one really, he loves the industry. Look at that guy. God bless you, sir. There's a man who believes. The rest of you wouldn't list with half the, oh, I got one of the person. You were sort of, you were sort of tentative about it. You were kind of thinking about it. I've asked this question of dozens of audiences to thousands of people. Nobody raises their hand. Nobody, very few people. 99% of people don't raise their hand. They wouldn't list with more than half the agents in their market. That's not good. If you were all doctors at a hospital, and I said, how many of you willing to be operated on by 50% of the doctors in the hospital, and nobody raised their hand, we'd all be like, oh, my God, that's the worst thing in the world. Meanwhile, we inflict these people on consumers every day, but we wouldn't work with them ourselves. That's a terrible thing. All right, there you go. I got, uh, I'm preaching now. This is good. All right, we got the erosion of the value proposition. What has replaced the value proposition? 20 years ago, we were the gatekeepers. We were the gatekeepers. We controlled the access to information. You want to know what's on the market, you got to come to us. You want to get into the stream of commerce, you got to come to us. Are we still the gatekeepers? No. But have we evolved our value proposition since then? See, we're still, I think, mired in this idea that a lot of what we do for our clients is we put their house into the market. I still see in people's listing presentations, when they talk about marketing, they have things like a picture of the house and then arrows from the house going to like Zillow and Truly and Realtor.com saying, you know, we advertise your house all over the internet. Is that still like a big service that we do? Is that still like a differentiator among other brokers? Everybody does that. The MLS does that for you. Everybody is on every website. That's a commodity now. But we still talk about it. It's important. We haven't refined the value that we give. We haven't come up with a, a new set of services or, or articulated better the services we actually provide. We're still talking about marketing their homes all over the world, right? But here's the thing. When you talk about disruptors, the easiest thing in the world for somebody to do to, to challenge us is to challenge us on that playing field is to say, oh, well, you're going to list with that broker for all that money? List with me for $500, and I'll get your home into, into all those websites. And then for $500, they hire a photographer for $150. They take the photos. They hire somebody in you know, Turkey or Jakarta to write the description. If they can speak English, they write the description for $0.30. Cents, and then it goes into MLS. It gets distributed out. And they can replicate your marketing package for very little money. It's not worth, if that's all we do, that's not enough to hold us out, to protect us from disruption. It's not enough to say that we market your home. It's not, it used to be, it's not anymore, but we're still talking about it as if it was. All right. Oh, wait, we're still on the, wait, where's the next one? There we go. I was just, this is behind this. Number five. 
I'm sorry, I'm having a little problems. There we go. Number five, a painful transaction. I said the transaction hasn't gotten better in 20 years. It still is really hard to buy a house and to sell a house. It takes too long. It costs a lot. It takes a lot of energy. It's so difficult. How many, let me ask you a question. How many of you in the last five years have sold or bought your primary residence? That's really good. That's a lot of you. So you know what I'm going through. You know what I'm talking about. It should be a rule that if you're a realtor, you should have to sell your home every five years so you know what everybody's going through. Because those of you that raise your hand, you know how hard it is, even when you're a professional, how hard it is. Let me say this. How many of you have lived in the same home for more than 25 years? Raise your hand. You know, I hate people like you. How are we supposed to make any money when you won't turn over the inventory like that? 25 years. It's a painful transaction. Part of this is unfair to us because the part of the transaction that we cover, people actually have a pretty good experience. People like shopping for homes, and selling a home is complicated and difficult, but if you do it well, they can feel good about it. The, the place where the transaction runs aground becomes really painful is after we get the accepted offer, when it's largely out of our hands and we're, we're project managing and we're quarterbacking, but we can't control what happens during the mortgage process and what happens if the problem with the title comes up. So like where the transaction goes to ground is usually outside our control, but who bears the blame for it? Because we're the ones who are in charge. We're the ones who are running the show. I put up this chart because I always find this really funny. It's called the real estate happiness chart, all right? The blue line is the buyer, the, the red line is the seller. And what's funny is that buyers and sellers are happy at different times of the transaction. So at the beginning, buyers are happy. See, the blue line's way up at the top. Why are buyers happy? Because they're shopping. Shopping is fun. Looking at homes is fun. You get to walk in. You get to make fun of people's decor. You get to imagine yourself in their homes. It's always a lot of fun. And it's fun up until you get an accepted offer, at which point now, you got to get the contract. You got to do the inspections. Now it becomes painful, and that blue line dips. Meanwhile, sellers at the beginning of the transaction are miserable. They got to detail the house. They got to stage the house. They got to keep the house looking nice. They have to endure people coming in and making fun of their decor. They got to deal with showings. They got to deal with all that stuff, right? But then after they get into contract, they're happy. And they're done, right? Sellers are pretty much done at that point. They don't have much to do after they, if they maybe if they have a CO problem or something like that. But generally, they're done. They're very happy. And it's like right after you get married, right? They've been like sucking it in for like the last six weeks. They've been cleaning up everything, picking up the socks, putting the dishes away, doing all that stuff. Now it gets in a concert. They're like, oh, I can just let it all go. I can relax. But we don't do enough to make it easier. This is why industries get disrupted. They get disrupted because they don't evolve to reflect the changing needs of the consumers that they're dealing with. Kodak did not, um, did not evolve at the, with the change of digital photography. Sears didn't evolve. Taxis are challenged right now about whether they're going to evolve. Borders bookstores didn't evolve. The question is, are we going to evolve? Are we going to adapt to the change of what our clients need? How do we fight off disruption? We got to get better at our jobs, collectively. We got to do a better job for our consumers. And how do we do that? I got a simple formula for you. All right, I'm going to explain this formula. Number one, we got to think expansively about what people need from us. We can't just like think about what they needed last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. What do they need today? And, and think creatively, think expansively in a way that we didn't when they asked, they want to know what their home is worth. We thought very narrowly about that need. We thought about it as a sales opportunity. Zillow thought creatively about it. That's why Zillow is on the screen. They thought creatively about how to service that need. They came up with a way to service it. I'm not even sure that Zillow knew how they were going to monetize their service when they said, we'll just tell people what their home is worth. They figured out how to monetize it, didn't they? God bless them. They're such a smart company. They monetized it through us. We pay for it now. And then number three, you got to execute well. So let's go over each of these. What do I mean by them? First, think expansively about what people need. Think about some of the great companies in the world and how they got that way. They got that way because they thought, they, they, in many cases, they created needs that didn't even exist. Think about what like Apple has done over and over again. You know, Apple created the need for, the, there, there was already digital files for music. The iPod created a need for people to have in their pocket. We had Blackberries with email. Apple created the need to have a, have a computer in your pocket with apps and like everything you could ever need, right? 
Then they came up with the iPad. When the iPad came out, people were like, it's just a big iPhone. What's the big deal? And now they're like, they can't get it out of their hands. Apple almost identifies needs before we know we even have them. And it's not just them. Think about like what McDonald's did back in the day. McDonald's recognizing that, that, the, that the, our lifestyle was changing, that women weren't home as much to make hot dinners for their kids. They were working, and they needed something that they could pick up on the way home that would be consistent and hot and good and the kids would like. So they created fast food. It didn't exist as a category. Go back to 1940, ask people, go back in time, go to somewhere 1940, where's the nearest fast food place? They don't even know what fast food is. McDonald's invented it. Starbucks. We were always very happy with a little cup of coffee. I never knew I needed 20 ounces of coffee every morning. We go, look at these cups that we have here. Well, these cups are completely inadequate. Yeah, we need that. Go hold that up, Steve. Look at Steve. That's what, that's what we drink now. They created needs that we didn't even know we had. And that's what we need to do. We have to think expansively. What do people need? That's what, for example, a company like Open Door is doing. Open Door has a business model where if you go on their website and you put in your address, they'll give you an offer. They'll buy your home in three days. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's the pitch. Why? Because they're saying there are people that need to be out of their home. They can't go through the process that we're going to go through. It's going to take at least a month or two to get the home sold. They'll buy the home in three days for what they say is a reasonable price for a transaction fee. That's a need. That's thinking expansively about what people need and creating a service that will address that need. So think creative about how to service the need. Think about like what Netflix did, all right? The history of the movie rental business, okay? You go back 40 something years, 50 years, now some of you are, young, are too young to even know this, there was a time when you saw a movie in a theater and that was it. You never saw that movie again. It ran in the theater, right? You're left, you, ran, you think about it now, it seems crazy, but like, the movie would come out, it'd be in the theater for a couple of months, then it'd be out of the theater, and you would never, there was no way to watch it again. It was maybe once, the, the Sunday night, who remembers ABC Sunday night at the movies? They play a movie every Sunday night, it was an event, because you get to watch a movie on your TV at home. It was crazy. So that changed in the 70s, when all of a sudden you had home video recorders, and the movie studios realized that people might buy movies to watch at home on the v v VHS or beta, whatever the tapes were. So they started to sell them. But they were really expensive. And there was a guy in LA, whose name now is escaping me at the moment, but he came up with the idea of having a rental business. He bought the movies, and then he would rent them to people for like $10 a day, and then they'd bring them back and he'd rent them again. He invented the video rental industry. And then what happened? Those of you that can remember, it swept across the country. Every, every small town had a little video rental business, right? Usually a mom and pop shop, they had like 100 movies. You go in, you rent a movie. You remember those, the little mom and pop shops? And they got wiped out by who? Blockbuster wiped them out. Because Blockbuster saw that there was a better way to service the need for home movies. They said, let's have big stores with all sorts of movies, and you never run out of the new movies that people want to rent and we're going to upsell you with popcorn and candy and all the other stuff, and let's make it a what night? Let's make it a blockbuster night. Friday night was blockbuster. Blockbuster owned Friday night. And they had a great service. People loved blockbuster. Blockbuster went in 10 years and became a $10 billion company. It had thousands of employees, 50, 60,000 employees, had 9,000 shops all across the country. Big, big, well-lit shops in every major community. The problem was their system was built on something horrible. Their system didn't work because the only way that Blockbuster could make money was what? How did Blockbuster make all its money? I'm looking at the gentleman here because he seems to remember Blockbuster, unlike the rest of you who are looking at me blankly for the most part. How did Blockbuster make money? Who got it? Right. Lay fees and rewinding. God, the rewinding. The millennials in the room don't even know what I'm talking about with rewinding. Yes. Yes, there were tapes, yet you would watch and they'd be at the end. Then you'd have to rewind them and wait like six minutes for it to rewind to the beginning. Because if you didn't rewind it and you returned it without rewinding it, they charge you extra. But the real thing was the late fees. You, you rent it on Friday, you watch it on Friday night. It stays in the machine for like three days because you forget that it's there. By Tuesday, you're like, oh, i got to bring that movie back. So you rewind it, you put it back in the case, you put it in your car, you drive to work, you drive home from work, you look over, it's still there on the seat next to you. 
Next day, off to work, come back, no, I forgot to bring it back again. A week later, with like $30 of late fees that you'd have to rent them. People hated the late fees. So what happened? Netflix. Netflix created a better system. Now, again, you millennials, you think Netflix is a streaming service. It wasn't. We're way ahead of the streaming service. We're back in the mid-90s when what Netflix did was created a DVD. I don't have time to explain to you what a DVD is. You just have to roll with it, all right, millennials? You get a DVD. You would rent the DVD. You would, you would subscribe. You'd give them three titles online, and they would send you three DVDs. When you watched one, you'd put it back in the mail. The mail, look it up. Just Google what the mail is. <laughs> M-A-I-L. If you look up M-A-L-E, you get a very different set of websites. M-A-I-L. You put it in the mail. It goes out. And then you would get another movie, and you'd always have, so they charge you 10 bucks a month, no late fees. You always had movies handy. Netflix was a great service. They destroyed Blockbuster, drove them into bankruptcy within 10 years. Because people hated the late fees, and, and Netflix was a better system. They thought creatively about how to service the need. Netflix was so creative. And then Netflix, which is a really, really good company, then transitioned. Netflix could have easily turned into Kodak, right? But Netflix, instead of sitting on its business, evolved its business into streaming and became the number one streaming company. Netflix is a very smart company. But think of all these companies and what they've done, how they thought creatively about how to service the need. Amazon is just a great way to buy stuff. Shake Shack, do you have Shake Shack down here? It's just a, a better burger. It's like a better, there's always a line at Shake Shacks where I go. Uber is just a better system for getting a, a ride. All right, so we gotta think expansively what people need, gotta think creatively how to service the need. Then we have to execute. A lot of it's about execution, right? It's not enough to identify what people need. Like, it might be people really need Thai food in this, in this community, all right? And I'm gonna create really good Thai, I have a really good recipes, and, I'm gonna, and then you open your business, but like, you mismanage it, and you, you have bad way, uh, serving staff, and like, it takes forever to get dinner. That's not executing. You're not going to run a successful business unless you can execute. Look at these companies here. Walt Disney runs Disney World. Disney World is a, is a theme park like other theme parks, but it's not like other theme parks. Disney is different, right? Four Seasons is a hotel. It's a different type of hotel. Nordstrom's is a department store. There are lots of department stores, but Nordstrom's, because of the way they execute on the customer service experience, is different. Just go back to Disney for a second. Here's what we're trying to get at. This is the concept of execution. And it's this great story about Disney. There's a book called The Disney Way by a guy named Bill Capodacli. He wrote a book basically about Disney's approach to operational excellence and to execution, about how to do things. And like, if you've been to Disney, you know it's spotless and everybody smiles and like, everything's just run well. Like you go to, you go to some theme parks and like, it just it seems shy, you know, it just doesn't seem as, you go to like, like they have, they have, what Disney did, they're very smart. Like, they built a whole underground city. That's where all the people work. Like, they, there's hidden entrances and exits, exits. So you go underground, that's where you go from place to place. So, like, when Mickey is done shaking hands, right? Mickey's done shaking hands, he just turns, oh, he turns the corner and he's gone. Because he slipped behind a bush and there's a door and he goes down underneath. So, like, there's nobody, nobody turns a corner and there's Mickey, you know, smoking a cigarette with his, you know, the hat underneath his. Hey, kid, I'm off. I'm off right now, kid, all right? And the kid's like traumatized. So Disney has this operational excellence. And Bill Cabadacli writes this book about it. And he's at a conference speaking. And before the conference, he's sitting at the pool or something. And a guy comes up to him and says, you're Bill Cabadacli? Yes. You wrote the Disney way? Yes. I got to tell you, that book changed my whole business. Turns out the guy ran a Midwestern manufacturing plant, had read the book, and it, he had adopted it. He bought books for everybody in his staff, which by the way, if you like a book, Kalea, if you like a book, you should buy it for everybody in the board, everybody around. So he bought a book for everybody, then he created t-shirts and, and they posters and they had task force and they built a whole operational scheme around what they learned from the Disney way. So this guy's explaining to Bill Capodacli about how meaningful the book was to him. And he says, and we came up with a slogan and the slogan was to express our articulation of the Disney way for our business. And what's the slogan? The slogan is, we clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. That's their metaphor. We clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. And that's, quite honestly, between me and you, not a bad motto. I'd be very happy if my agents basically adopted the motto that as soon as there's a problem, you fix it. As soon as they, oh, you see something on the ground, you pick it up. You see a problem in a deal, you fix the deal. 
right? We clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. So the guy explains that very proudly. And Bill Capodacli shakes his head and says, listen, I'm thrilled you bought all the books, and I'm glad it made a difference for you, but you've missed the whole point of the Disney way. And the guy's shocked. How could I have missed that? I read the book like 100 times. And Capodacli says, your slogan is wrong. Your slogan is that we clean the windows as soon as they get dirty. At Disney, the windows never get dirty. That's operational excellence. Operational excellence is you put into play systems that never let the problem come up, right? You go to the hairdresser, you make the appointment for the next time you're going to come in before the roots start to show, which I'm like a week late, right? You got to go before. You got to brush your teeth every day, not when you get a cavity. You got to do things every day as preventative maintenance to keep things in. And I talked to Bill Capodacli about this because I wanted to ask him about this story. And he said the best example you can give now is they changed the light bulbs at Disney on a rotating basis well before their lifespan would be up. Because they never want a light to be out, so they don't wait for it to go out and then replace it. They just replace working light bulbs, which is crazy. All right, so what we need to do, we got 10 lessons. I'll have to go through them quickly. Things that agents can do on a day-to-day -day basis to adopt this philosophy. One, everybody needs a real estate agent. Everybody, even if they're not buying or selling. What I have up there is if I went to you and I said to you, who's your accountant? You'd have a name. Who's your dentist? You'd have a name. I'd hope you'd have a name, right? Come on. Dental health is very important. If I asked you who your hairstylist was, most of you would have a name. But if I were to go out to Austin and walk down the street and say to people, do you have an accountant? Yes. Do you have a hairstylist? Yes. Do you have a dentist? Yes. Do you have a realtor? No. Unless they're buying or selling, they don't think of themselves as having a realtor, but they should. Everybody needs one. Who are they going to call when they're thinking of putting in a new bedroom and they want to know how to fix the property value? Who are they going to call if they're thinking of putting in a a uh, pool and they want to know they're redoing their kitchen, they should call us. We sh they should come to us. We're willing to answer those questions. we got to make it clear to them that, like, I am your realtor whether you're buying or selling because someday you're going to sell. Someday, except for those seven or eight people who lived in their house for 30 years, everybody else moves eventually. So you establish the relationship today. You maintain the relationship as long as you need to. You'd be willing to provide service to them even when they're not buying or selling. And when they do buy or sell, they come to you. Everybody needs a real estate agent, and that real estate agent should be you. Number two, focus your lead generation on what people need. Like, listen, you go to somebody's house for a party. What do, you, do you show up empty-handed? Do you show up with a knife and a fork? No, you bring a bottle of wine, you bring flowers, you bring a cake. If you're going to go show up at someone's house, either truly or metaphorically, by making a call to them out of the blue, you should have something of value that you're giving to them. You call, like we have all these programs to work your sphere. Like, like until you're going to call somebody, if you're going to ask them for helping your business, you've got to give them something. Show up with something. Bring something to the table. You're going to call an expired. Instead of just calling an expired and using some old hacky script about how long before you hire another agent to help you sell the home, why not like go over their listing, with, like send them a little report about things that, have changed in the market in six months, send them an updated CMA. Send them information that might help them understand why their home didn't sell. Focus on things that people need and service those needs, and you'll find lead generation becomes a lot easier. Number three, turn presentations into consultations. The average listing presentation is boring. It is a performance. Why are we performing? Why do we feel we need to do a song and dance for people? The most effective presentation you can make is you sit down with somebody, you start asking them questions about themselves. What are you looking for? What are your biggest concerns? And then you answer their questions. That's how you develop rapport with somebody. You don't develop rapport because you walk around and you say, oh, you like tennis? I like tennis. That's stupid rapport. The way you build rapport is you show an authentic interest in them. You ask them questions. And that's true about listing presentations. It's true about dating, gentlemen. Gentlemen, you're on a date. Stop talking about yourself. Ask her questions about herself. So much more interesting, so much more effective at building rapport to actually find out what they need as opposed to doing your, let me tell you about myself, let me tell you about marketing. There's room for that. You do have to talk about yourself, but it should be in the context of finding out what it is they need from you. Number four, pricing should be collaborative. This idea that we go in to talk to a seller and we say, let me, I am the expert, trust me, I'm going to tell you what your home is worth. They don't trust you, right? They don't. And if you tell them what the home is worth, they're going to think that you're, they, 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 what happens? They think that you're underpricing as you're trying to get a quick sale. 
it's much more effective to, their need is to, for you to guide them into the pricing of their home, to show them what the market is telling them, to help them identify what the best price for the home is, not to tell them, but to show them and guide them. All these scripts, and here's a lot of these things are things that trainers have been teaching forever and ever, and we've been teaching people wrong on behalf of the training industry. I apologize. We've had it all wrong in a lot of ways because we've been imperious. We've been all agent-oriented, right? We need to be client-oriented. Agent-oriented is going in and doing a listing presentation that's all about you. Agent-oriented is doing pricing by saying, trust me, I'm the expert. It's not about you. It's about them. Focus on them and what they need. Number five, we've got to change the way we talk about marketing. This is a piece of my company we put together which basically tried to articulate a marketing matrix to say how marketing fits in with the overall scheme of things. But the basic message I would tell you about marketing is stop talking about distribution because everybody does distribution. Your differentiator in marketing is the quality of the content you create and the way you target the potential buyers. Targeting is like catnip to sellers. They love hearing about targeting. They love hearing you identify with them. You sit down and say, who do you think is the buyer for this home? Who do you think is going to be the buyer for the home? You know what a great line about that is? Tell me about you when you bought this home. Why? Because what I find more often than not, the person that buys the home is the person that bought it last time. You bought it 15 years ago. You were in a different stage of life. What stage of life were you in? Because that's probably that's more likely than not who's going to buy the house now. So let's figure out who that person is and let's start targeting our marketing to that person. We gotta change, we gotta stop talking about distribution because putting the property on the internet is no longer something that differentiates realtors. Number six, staging should be a core service. Everybody, how many people here are professional stagers? Everybody raise your hand. Everybody, you're all professional stagers, you are professional marketers, you are professional appraisers, that's what you do. It's appalling the state of real estate right now that we have for some reason figured out that we have to delegate out staging to interior decorators. 90% of staging is cleaning and decluttering. You do not need to be an interior decorator to know that when there are cobwebs on the front entrance, they should be cleaned. That when there is 4,000 pieces of yadro on every nook and cranny of the house, that they should be put into storage. Staging is not just for high-end homes. It is not something that should be the province of, of, of like consultants, except for the high-end stuff that we're doing it now for anyway. Yeah, if it's a two or three million dollar house and you really want to have a design eye, yes, hire a professional stager. Prefer a four hundred thousand dollar house, three hundred thousand dollar house. You're not going to hire a professional stager because you should. You are capable of doing that. And it's really an important service. Let me ask you a show of hands. How many of you would say that more than half the homes right now for sale in Austin present beautifully? That's uh, some of you, a few of you. That's unbelievable. More than half of the people who have listed their home with a professional realtor in Austin have listed with someone who has not convinced them that to get the best price of their home and to get it sold, they got to make it look nice. They gotta make it look like a model home. Why? Because we don't think we're qualified. We think it's only for a high end. We're afraid to have the conversation with the seller because we think they're gonna, we're judging them. There's ways to deal with it. Go get your certification. When you get the certification on staging, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna realize, oh my God, I knew 90% of this. Because most of staging is common sense. And it's really important, and I believe in professional stagers. They should do what they're doing now, which is really high end homes that need a decorator's eye, they should do. But like, we should be doing what I call detailing for every listing, not just the high-end stuff. Number seven, we got to emphasize transaction management. Transaction management is one of the most important things we do, and we never talk about it. We know this. The most important thing you do for your sellers is that you help them through the process from contract to closing. All the minefields, all the problems. We built this thing for our company, which tried to articulate all the different things we do from the top left as the first meeting, to the closing, all the different steps along the way. <coughs> Every one of them is a dot. So when someone says, well, I want you to discount your commission, it's like, look at all these dots. Oh, how many, uh, look how many dots there are that I have to do. How many of these dots you want me to take away? We don't talk about it enough. It's one of the most important things we do. We should emphasize it because you know what? You can't manage that transaction from India or Indonesia or anywhere else, discounters and the people that are trying to do this on the cheap, 
Managing transactions, expensive requires local expertise. Number eight, we gotta improve the real estate transaction. Oh, we gotta improve the real estate transaction, um, which, which has to do with trying to improve communication, educating our clients, preparing them for the process, doing a better job facilitating mortgage and title. Number nine, we gotta know our value. What we do is really important. What we do is really valuable. We create a market for homes. Homes in Austin sell for exactly what they're worth because we cooperate together to create a transparent and open market and everybody knows what the homes are selling for, what they've sold for. You can work with one agent and see the entire market and everything else. Last point, we gotta learn to bring the wow. You gotta look for opportunities to do something special for your clients. And I'm gonna tell you a quick story and then I'm gonna close out about bringing the wow and why there's a thing of rock salt up there. There was this guy I know from the industry and he lives in upstate New York, about two hours north of me. And his thing, he's one of these guys that he does, he's always reaching out, he builds all his business by referral, he's always reaching out to his clients, he brings them gifts, he does things like that. So every year when it's the first snow, and this is like north of Albany, so the first snow is like mid-August, okay? He goes out right before the first snow and he goes and he buys 20 pound bags of rock salt. And he writes a personal note and he ties the personal note to the rock salt and he goes with his kid in his pickup and he goes and he drops off the rock salt at all of his top referral clients' houses. Which is a nice thing, right? That's, a, that's like a cool thing to do for your clients. And he always gets a lot of thank yous. Oh, that was so thoughtful, it started to snow and I had the rock salt all handy. Because no one keeps the rock salt for the, they always run out at the end of the year. But one time he did it, and he gets a call from one of his top referral clients. And the guy says, Bob, I gotta tell you something. I was out with my wife, we were out at the doctors, and she's having some health problems, and we got some news that really wasn't so great. And we were really just, ugh. And we get in the car, and we start to drive home, we're both depressed, and it starts to snow. And I realized that I don't have any rock salt, so we're gonna go home, and now instead of being able to be with her, I gotta go out to get rock salt. And it's just another beating, another bad thing that happened to me today. And we pull into the, into the driveway and we look on and on the front stoop there's a bag of rock salt with your, with your card. And we both just start to cry. Now here's the thing guys. I don't know how many times I've told that story. I will tell you, I will guarantee you the guy that found the rock salt on his front stoop has told the story more than I have because his agent made a meaningful difference to him by doing nothing other than thinking creatively about what that person needed and how to satisfy that need. And like, yeah, you're not always gonna hit a grand slam like that where you affect somebody in such an emotional way, in such a personal way. But if you are constantly doing really nice things for people, if you're constantly thinking about what they need rather than what you need in your personal life, in your professional life, if you're constantly focused on other people's needs and how to take care of them, you know what? Really good things will always happen to you. So I'll leave you with that thought. I thank you very much for having me here today. I hope you enjoyed it. And have a great day here. <laughs>